Let's do some news! Today's date is November 8th, 2019. There's only a handful of shows left for the end of the year. Can you believe that? We're not going to do anything around uh, the holidays, so that's two weeks that are definitely gone. Uh, and yeah, wow. So we, I think we only got like maybe four more episodes after this, I think. Something like that. So yeah, the time is 3.10 p.m. As it usually is when we do the news. And... Today, <laughs> 2019 was a mess, and we're not even done. Yeah, I guess, I, I guess, should we do like a 2019 wrap-up or something? Or do we do a decade wrap-up? Or is it like two different shows? One's a 2019 wrap-up, and one's like a decade wrap-up. How do we even approach that? Like, the decade is actually ending, and we, there's so much to cover. Uh, like, how do you even handle that? You know, like, 2019 was a mess. But there are definitely stories that happened before 2019 that were, like, that were also pretty fucking bad. <laughs> so, two shows? Oh, man. Oh, man. 2019 deserves its own shows. Oh, my gosh. All right. Well, I guess we'll have to have two, two, two shows that will basically... I'll have to go through... I guess I'll have to go through, like, notes for previous DigiHoos or something. All the way back. Oh, if we're going back decade, uh, the whole decade, shit, I'll have to go with, like, Twimo notes, which I have. Which I have. But holy shit, this could be a whole lot of research. But it'll be worth it. I think it'll be fun. We could just sit there and just go through some of like the most, I don't know, interesting stories or maybe controversial stories as I've done in the past. But this time we'll just like talk about it because I have to edit a fucking 40 minute video where I do hardcore ass research like that and fucking voice and edit. That shit will never get done. Not at least on 2029. Uh, so at least this is the first thing you have 10 years of footage to give you YouTube to check. I do. Isn't that weird? Yeah, I do have a whole decade of shit. To, wow. Weird. Oh, my gosh. All right. So. First up, first up in today's news, we're going to talk about Deadspin. I like starting off the news, because this is a gaming-oriented news show. I like starting it out with news that does not specifically point towards gaming, but, but, can very easily. So, Deadspin, which is a site that, uh, that is a sister site to sites like Kotaku, um, <laughs> is basically dead. Uh, they have new owners called the uh, called Geo Media that took over in April. Uh, they took over both everything that was left over from the Gizmodo Media Group. Remember Gizmodo, Gawker, all that stuff basically just just disappeared. Uh, they bought uh, they bought it up from Univision, who owned the properties, and then they also went and bought Geo Media. By the way, Geo Media also went and bought uh, the Onion, and so I know I love the name Tailspin. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, starting probably, what, two weeks ago, uh, they were told to stick to sports. Now, Deadspin is technically, technically a site about, uh, uh with, that has sports news. But it also is very much a kind, I mean, kind of like a Gawker derivative, where they focus a bit more on the people behind sports, right? Uh, and the new owners said, just stick to sports. Well, the staff did not appreciate that. And pretty much everyone, actually, yes, everyone, every, every person on staff, every writer on staff has since left the company. Uh, and <laughs> it's, I'm only laughing because, because I'm torn. And I'm being to I'm totally honest with you guys. Like, I, I am torn because on one hand, I hate to see some random company, like some random, you know, group just come in, buy, buy up a media outlet and then just start just filtering people out. Because I feel like at one point in time, I was part of that. I was one of those people that was basically just filtered out because the, per the company that bought us was like, oh shit, I forgot we bought this company. Well, let's go ahead and install our best friends to work there. And then we'll just, I don't know, let everybody else go. It's basically what happened to me and kittens and a bunch of other people. Um, and so I'm sympathetic to them on that front. But part of me might be okay if they actually closed down Kotaku. Part of me might be okay. I know there's some talented writers there. Some, there's a few talented writers there that can find jobs elsewhere. But if Kotaku goes down because this company that took them over wants to try to make money and they don't feel like they can make money the way that things have been run before, uh, run uh, previously, and Kotaku ends up falling because of it, well then, 
that's just what happens. Uh, it's, it's it happened to me. It's gonna happen to other other folks as well. So let's go ahead and scroll down here. As you can see the process here. So Barry Pacheski, who was part of who's who was basically uh, I think it was editor in chief for uh, about ten years or so. Um, have has was fired first, and then oh, so and so is no longer working at Deadspin. Deadspin. That means I no longer work, de work at Deadspin. And then this person left, and then this person left, and then this person left, and then it pretty much ended up being a mass exodus, uh, exodus of pretty much everyone. And then, uh, and then Geo Media released a statement saying that uh, it says while amusing, our readers haven't actually come to Deadspin, Deadspin for stories like Classic Rock ranked, or you're goddamn right, it's layering season, or it's okay to log off. Uh, and basically saying that the site was not getting the views that, uh, or these articles that were not sport related, not non sport related, were not getting the viewership or the views that they had, uh, that would have, uh, justified their existence. And the response was that this is actually, uh, demonstra demonstrably false. That these these articles do bring a lot of traffic, and we know we we know. I, I think I think those of us who could just consume this kind of media on the regular, we know that those kinds of articles that are that are that are that are basically just slightly slightly off to the side from the normal content that you get, that you know are typically um, either more personal, like you're you're uh, either attacking or profiling a person for some reason, or uh, or clickbaity. We know that those are the sites that, or those are the articles that drive the most traffic. And so when this guy says, uh, S uh, Spanfeller says that, <laughs> well, these articles just don't, uh, don't bring in any kind of traffic. We could pretty much assume that's a lie <laughs> or that's at least, at least at the very least, he's very, very much misinformed. Uh, news will happen. It doesn't matter which, uh, which, where they get it from. Yes. Yeah. yeah no, the news will still happen. Um, so previous to this. It didn't quite make a, uh, maybe it didn't grab a lot of headlines because it wasn't really something that was on my radar because the people that I follow didn't really talk about it that much. But another uh, former Gawker, Gawker Media property called uh, Splinter, which was, excuse me, uh, which was more of a political, uh, political leaning, uh, a left, I guess, a pl politically left leaning, like a uh, uh, um, uh, editorial site was also closed. And this was at the beginning of October. So in the same month, we basically had like two sites that effectively closed. And just basically disappeared. And these are both in the Gawker Media group, which again, like like I said, includes sites like like uh, Jezebel. There's uh, one for for cars. I can't remember the name. Uh, one for uh, for car enthusiasts, and um, and of course Kotaku. So so it is it is uh, it is my opinion that the writings on the wall for other former Gawker Media uh, uh, sister sites that they are going to be probably Jalopnik, thank you so much uh they're probably going to be going uh by the wayside uh sometime soon now um if we kind of go through this you can see that there were there were uh this is the where i'll keep this uh linked below i actually go and link it in chat here for you guys but this is the actual event list which is kind of handy that twitter does they put together this list that uh basically gives you a pretty good rundown of what happened and who are the major players involved of, of what's happened with uh uh with um uh, with Gawker Media and well, I keep calling it Gawker Media, but with Go Media, um, the root. Anyway, yeah. So uh, yeah, it just it's 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 a good breakdown of of, of everyone's involved. Jason Schreier has a couple of, of comments. I've said before that I'm a, I'm a fan of Jason Schreier. In terms of if I had to pick somebody at Kotaku that I like the most, <laughs> but then he says shit like this because of course people are saying, oh, well, this is only only matter of time for Kotaku like goes down too. And then he's just like this. He's like, got some bad news for all the alt-right chuds spamming my Twitter feed today. Kotaku is still alive and fighting, and two I already know how to code. Because apparently everybody that's, that sees the very obvious uh, next steps of these sites continuing to close, uh, well, uh, I guess we're all alt-right uh, folks, which is just... This is the kind of shit that makes me think, really, Jason? Are you fucking serious, Jason? Actually, this person right here just summed it up pretty well. He says, I get your point, Jason. I extremely appreciate your fantastic work on... Uh, but Kotaku is pissed off more than just the alt-right. I'm left. And some opinion articles leave me flabbergasted at just how, how out from blood they are. Sometimes even to exaggerate or fabricate points. Um, I guess it's all going hell too. What is this? What is this? Uh, what is this uh, link you sent me here that you just posted? Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Let me take a look at this. Top. This better be good, Top. You don't just drop Jason Schreier links without nothing else to see. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that was already part of the... Thank you. That was already part of the, uh, the list that I put up. That was already part of the list I put out, man. Come on, man. Come on. We already, that's already there. It's in that moments thing. That's why I put the moment shit up there for you guys. Uh, so following this, 
uh, some of the departed writers uh, actually have, have, have actually followed a, uh, a, a, an actual form of complaint against uh, part of the laugh for you. Sorry, I know I read chat. And I just think it's part it's for me because I'm the one streaming. And I just I shouldn't think that. Uh, so so there are some lawsuits in line for the CEO, Jim Spanfeller, uh, because of some of his actions that, uh, that that he allegedly took. Uh, when he took over the company. Uh, some of those were that he brought in some of his, uh, uh, basically he turned, he brought in some of his buddies from other companies that he worked with previously uh, to take over certain areas of the, uh, of the company. Now this is, it's so funny because I'm reading this and it's like, it's like, oh my God, this is exactly what fucking happened with Zam. Like this is exactly what happened with Zam. He was like, somebody, somebody gets put in charge and then they decide, you know what? I'm going to bring all my buddies over from other companies and we're going to run, we're going to run uh, the show. And they just basically let everybody else go. And so that's what happened here. And in one complaint, uh, there are two complaints that were filed. One of them is for, uh, for, for them not paying out his, uh, his salary or his, um, uh, his separation, uh, um, fee. I don't call it fee. God damn, I can't think of a fucking word right now. Uh, but it says that what was the actual it was a five hundred thousand dollars that he was owed for uh for leaving severance thank you so much thank you so much uh the other complaint says that uh, it says in one complaint filed wednesday on in los angeles uh former geo vice president of west coast sales sued the company for gender and pay discrimination and negligent hiring she alleges spanfeller demoted her and gave away half her sales to uh, uh half her sales territory to a former colleague from Playboy, and this—I mean, this just goes again. I could—I could totally vouch for this being common practice when, uh, uh, when, when you have a company that, or a group that that buys uh, a set a set of sites or whatever, they plant their own person there from wherever other places that they worked. Yeah, it's nepotism, totally. It's like they just bring folks in and whatever. Now these these folks may be qualified to technically run a company. Uh, I can't speak to this person who was from Playboy, what he's doing with, uh, with certain areas of, uh, of the now defunct Gawker, Gawker Media. Um, and this is how you get Doom 2016 Polygon. Uh, so, yeah, so, in closing, <laughs> because right now, to me, I will be surprised, I will be shocked if Kotaku and other sites in its current form exist uh by i would say like maybe middle of next year just given the fact that they like it was april they took over um and just in october there's been two like two sites that have effectively been closed down either through actually being closed down or being uh, uh or having people just being being pushed away like just people just quitting and that's pretty much it so uh so it's it is looking like it is very possible that we may be seeing the end of of sites like Kotaku and Jalopnik and and Jezebel and all those other sites, and I know a lot of people have not a whole lot of uh, of of faith in those companies for whatever reason, or those those media sites for whatever reasons. Uh, specifically, Kotaku, really, I think I know exactly. Oh no, not Kotaku. No, I hear you on that. Um, but yeah, and it's what's really interesting to me on top of everything else is that even though everybody left. I guess the new owners don't have access to the Twitter accounts. So the Twitter account with 1 million followers, a Deadspin account, is still not active, obviously. But the last thing that was posted was Deadspin's audience numbers don't support the stick to sports mandate. And it goes on to talk about this. And so this is not even, obviously, not even a, a, a Gawker Media site that it links to. It links to the LA Times. Uh, I don't think that this tweet would be here if uh, if, if if the new owners had access to uh to the the twitter feed so i actually wonder if that's ever going to get resolved it is i mean it's a it's a million followers it's definitely a reach as somebody wants but personally i think that dead spin uh as a whole is probably just dead it'll probably just sit there for i don't know for a while and then just disappear um and then we'll start hearing news about other other sites in the same family basically starting to uh to disappear as well uh, things you could do when you own the company. Yeah, exactly. It just, it, to me, just reads like, you know, the, they bought the company from Univision who wasn't really doing anything with it. Uh, it's, I can't imagine, uh, knowing how much money gaming websites don't make, <laughs> uh, I cannot imagine that 
that a site like Kotaku is profitable. Like, I don't know about, I don't know about Deadspin and all these other sites, but uh, to have so many people on staff as full-time writers, I can't imagine that they're going to, that they, that this is a profitable venture, like a fully profitable event, like, like profitable enough to warrant uh, even giving a shit about it. Like breaking even is not going to be enough for an executive, right? Breaking even is not like the, the company's got to grow. Uh, there are a million of them. It's got to be, it's got to be generating something. Exactly. You're using it for a name until it dies. Yeah. Well, there's no writers now. So, <laughs> so I think Deadspin is, is definitely dead. They're not going to hire new writers to take over and just pretend like nothing happened. They actually have gone through and disabled the comments on the site. If you go through any of the articles on the site, you'll see that, uh, that all the comments, the uh, comment sections have been pretty much turned off. So, so interesting there. Uh, next up, my understanding is that Desmond was one of the few, the few pretty profitable sites they had, which is why it, uh, it was shocked they screwed with it. Yes, Cliff, you could say that. <laughs> next up, popular YouTuber, Faze Jarvis. You guys know who this is? Probably not. Uh, so Faze Jarvis is a 17-year-old Fortnite YouTuber who has been banned from Fortnite. Uh, why, why do you care? You don't. You really don't. But it is, it is also, I, I feel like it's kind of interesting. Um, because I almost feel sympathetic, but at the same time, I don't. <laughs> because, because of esports, and because of, you know, what it's like to be a content creator, Creators are getting started younger and younger, right? Whether it's like, you know, a 13-year-old that's, that's, that's masquerading as a 14-year-old to be part of FaZe Clan, uh, or, or somebody that is making who knows how, much, how many thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars making Fortnite videos. Uh, wasn't he earning like $50,000 a month or something stupid? Probably was. I mean, I'm sure. Like most of these, most of these, uh, uh, like when they get to a certain point where they're like 2 million YouTube followers and, and like they're part of FaZe Clan, I'm going to have to assume, I'm going to have to assume that they were at least making $10,000 a month. At least. Now, I don't know. I don't know how much they're, they're making, but when you see how many views some of these, some of these guys have on their videos, even though they're not making it like cents, they're making like fractions of a penny on, on, on the, like per, per thousand views. Um, it still adds up when they have, you know, a million views. Uh, so the reason he got banned, as it states in the title, was because he was using an aimbot. And he says, it didn't even cross my mind to think that I could be banned for life <laughs> on Fortnite for those videos. And I went ahead and I pulled up the, uh, actually the video is right down here. And it shows here right in the first, first minute or so. This is the moment you've been waiting for. I'm gonna restart my game and I'm gonna have aimbot. You will see. Trust me, you will see. I don't miss a shot. Like actually yeah, playing with aimbot. aimbot. Actually playing with an aimbot. Oh, oh god, they're screaming. They're screaming. Whoa! How old are you? 17 years old. Okay, yo, what's going on, guys? I'm about another video. So. This is the video that got him, that actually got him, uh, canned, but yes, he, he used, he decided that it would be a good idea to buy an aimbot software and then use it to make a video, uh, <laughs> to demonstrate what it's like to use an aimbot. <clears throat> now... It does come across a little. It does come across a little bit like what did Dave Chappelle say? He said, "I'm I'm sorry, officer. I I didn't know I couldn't do that." That's what it sounds like. It totally sounds like this. Genius of the year, continue. Yeah, the reactions to this have been all over the map. People saying that because of him losing access to Fortnite, his life is ruined. And at 17 years old, I feel like, I feel like an old man, I, but at 17 years old, I feel like there's hope. I feel like there's still a lot of life left. When I think about all the shit that I've done since I was 17, I really, truly feel like this kid can continue to survive without Fortnite. Now, some people are criticizing Epic, saying that they're too harsh on him for, uh, for making a permanent band. People who have, who have, who have said this, uh, include, uh, let me see our buddy here. 
Ninja. And he says... He's still super young. So, like, it's such a, I think it's just a stupid kid making a stupid decision. Didn't really fully think about it. It wasn't in a tournament. It wasn't in a cash cup. wasn't in a, anything like that. I think that it should be, like, a six... Maybe, maybe, like, a six-month ban from, like, competitive. And, like... May, I don't know, man. Permanent, though? I like the hammer, I man. Mmm... I don't know. And this is the part where I am... I am truthfully torn. Because... On one hand, yes, I was a kid and I made some dumbass mistakes. They didn't have any kind of like lasting repercussions, really. Uh, but at the same time, I didn't have the platform that today's 17 year old 17 year olds could potentially have. Uh, I will say that the rule is don't fucking cheat or else you'll get banned. I feel like that's a pretty clear cut rule. Uh, but. <laughs> But, and, and nobody should be exempt from that. I think the only reason why I'm even slightly sympathetic is because it sucks that you're a kid and you feel like you've got life nailed. And then all of a sudden, life comes at you fast. And you get hit with a lifetime ban and the one thing that you make a shitload of money on. And then it's just fucking gone. And now you have to figure out what else you're going to do with your life. Maybe play another game. If you have the amount of skill that it takes to get this level of popularity on, in, in a certain game, switch fucking games. Uh, and don't, yes, and don't advertise cheat software to a million fucking people. And that's the biggest thing, and that's the thing that I think he doesn't really realize, is that when he shows, if he has a video, we're just gonna leave this play, uh, but when we have a video that shows how easy it is to, to succeed in a game using cheats, you really, really are advertising for it. Now, now, Ninja does go on, I'm not gonna mute this, but Ninja does go on to say that, uh, or say, well, did he, did he, did he put the link in the description? Like, is he linking to it? Is he talking about where he got it from? And the people he's playing with is like, no, it doesn't matter though. And he's like, oh, I don't know, man, it just kind of feels wrong. And I don't know, I don't know why he has this level of sympathy for him. Maybe it's because it's a, you know, fellow Fortnite player or something like that. But, but still, it, it's, if you, if you were to not allow some, if you were not to, to, uh, um, to ban somebody like this, the same way you would ban somebody who doesn't have a platform, then, then you're basically telling everybody that it's okay to cheat at least once. He'll be fine with his, oh yeah, he'll be fine with his, uh, with his, with his following. Absolutely. Uh, life comes in, it's curb stomps you growing, yeah, exactly. Grow up. Uh, <laughs> like, like it says the president of the either content creators are free, but what are you saying right here? These zooms right here, I gotta see what he's saying right here, hold on. Again, you know what I mean? I know it's different severity, I but mean, people like, can people can die when you rob a bank. Yeah, it's, it's a good thing. I'm, like, I'm oh, oh he's talking up. about robbing a bank, something like that. Like, the, 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 the conversation goes back and forth talking a little bit about this, but... Yeah, don't worry about it. That, that, that was an out-of-context clip there, but for the most part, yes, it's, it is, uh, there are people that are on both sides of the fence saying that he's young, he should be allowed to make mistakes, he shouldn't have a permanent ban, and there are other folks that are saying that he should be treated just like everybody else. And I do wonder if a lifetime ban is too much, maybe instead, like, a five-year ban. I feel like that is, I feel like, as a game company could actually benefit from that. Doing waves and waves of bans, and then in five years when their game is dead, all those players come back. Now, most of them will come back, they'll just download them and use another email address, but still, it, it, maybe, I don't know. Um, your CS 1.6 account is still, is still, uh, is still banned. Yeah, mine, mine is banned as well. Well, not my, my CS account, but my, uh, I think a BattleEye 1.0, I think on Battle Eye 1.0, with which is on the original Arma, uh, which we play in DayZ. Um, I think I'll ban on that one. It's, it's I, I've told a story a billion times, but the TLDR is basically I I used I I purchased and used cheats after I got approval to use them for a tournament. Uh, it was for the first Survivor games, and so the idea was that. The developers were supposed to supposed to uh, give us a uh, special spectator mode, which, as we know, they never put in. Uh, and when they didn't deliver, we were like, well, there's absolutely no way that we could cast this thing. We have no camera. And so I suggested, well, I'll just buy some cheats or something and then we'll just use it and then I'll just uninstall it. And that's it. Like, that's for me. I, I trust myself to uninstall it. And I did uninstall it and it was gone. And they were like, oh, that's fine. And you just want, we'll just make it that you won't get banned from, uh, uh, from Battle Eye. We'll just make it so you won't get banned. I was like, cool. I don't know what that means. Like, well, I, don't, I don't know, like, did I put a button or something like that? Or like, put my account information or whitelist me or something like that? I don't know what that means, but sure. And so I did it. And then I got banned anyway. And I was like, okay, well, fucking thanks. And then I followed up with them 
They're like, what are you talking about? It was like, all right, cool, man, thanks. But it doesn't matter because around that time I was actually done playing Daisy, anyways. But, but yes, I mean, you you cheat, you get banned. I mean, <laughs> yeah. So TLDR, uh, you cheat, you get banned. That's pretty much that's pretty much the way it works. Uh, <laughs> uh, although kids are punished differently by law, he's being tried as an adult in a world of video games that he hasn't that hasn't made that distinction. Interesting. So that that is you're basically kind of rephrasing the argument that uh, he's young and he should be allowed to make mistakes. Um, what can say the reality is that most people can do just that. Come back with a new email, etc. This guy can't. So it truly is lifetime ban. That seems like a reason for treating it differently. Interesting. Interesting. I uh, well, I I still feel like it's probably not good for business to have any kind of preferential treatment for uh for somebody who is a who is a creator and it sucks and you know i was i was on the ass end of this once and it sucked but i was like whatever what did i do i went and found other games to play and i do feel like and i was way older than 17 when that happened so i think that this young man is gonna be fine um but talking but your point about is he fucking really got boxers what the fuck is that uh <laughs> But talking about uh, a, a, a kid or somebody under the age of 18, a minor, being tried as an adult, these, these rules don't have an age limit, the max or minimum, anything. Like, the rule is you cheat, you get banned. It doesn't say if you cheat and you're over the age of 18, you get blank. Now, granted, there are special situations where if you, if you do something that could, like DDoS or something, and you're over the age of 18, well, then guess what? Like, you can be tried as an adult for that, right? Uh, and if you're under the age, then, you know, obviously that'll get handled on a case by case basis. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a rule. It's not, it's not a law. It's a rule from the company. And so, you know, all that merch, I know I gotta go to that merch. Jesus. Uh, so yeah, personally, I feel like, I feel like the kid's gonna be fine. I really, truly do. If he's talented enough to get this and he's got 2 million fucking YouTube followers and a half a million or whatever, uh, uh, Twitter followers, I think he'll, he'll be totally fine. I, again, I'm sympathetic because I was a kid too, and I made some dumbass mistakes. But I mean, we got Faze Banks. He says um, what Jarvis did is obviously stupid. It was a mistake, and the point has been made very clear. Fortnite is a huge part of his life, and I just don't see the punishment destroying a 17 year old kid's life. Roll eyes, uh, fitting the crime. Hashtag free Jarvis. And then we have uh, Bellular Gaming, and he says. What the fuck is this different rules for me bullshit? If I did something worthy of lifetime ban, then I should be banned. If doing it publicly with a platform, I should express less leniency. He later corrected his spelling of the word publicly. It's fine. Um, this guy's made some emojis. <laughs> Destroying his life said, don't belong in the same set. Yeah, they totally, they totally don't. They totally don't. Uh, <laughs> so Jarvis has responded recently saying, I'm going to take accountability for my actions and I understand completely why this has happened. I just wish I had known how severe the consequences were at the time and I would have never thought about doing it. I love all of you. Support me. This is not the end. It's not. Uh, I mean, he, what, where is he at right now? He's got, oh, he's got 177. Thousand. Still, he's got, he's got a hell of a following and he definitely worked hard to get there. I'm fairly certain that his fans are going to follow him to wherever he goes from here. Um, and what is this? Let me, let me follow up here. Technically, it is when you're breaking the user agreement and could actually be taken to court. Oh, you, oh, you guys are trying to, like, draw the line where, like, doing something in a video game could lead to, like, a loss. Of course, of course, that, that, that could happen. But, but in, in the case of, did you cheat? It says you can't cheat. <laughs> there are no laws there. <laughs> like, it's just, it's just you, you, you broke these rules. So, uh, you're done. And that's pretty much it. There's no, there's no legal precedent here other than the fact that you did, by playing this game, you obviously signed the agreement or clicked the OK button on this agreement. Too bad you didn't read it. Uh, if anything, this is a uh, this is a life lesson for other fourteen year olds who are looking to getting into uh, being a, a creator. They'll know not to not to cheat because the alternative is if they don't ban him, then all of the fourteen year olds that follow him who aspire to be him in as few as a couple years, they would think that it was okay. You could get away with it, and so Epic is well within the rights to. Uh, well within the rights, and I think morally correct, to go ahead and just ban this kid for life. Sucks to be him, but you learn. He'll come out the other side. He'll be fine, guys. We'll check. We'll check on him in about five years. We'll do a where are they now, okay? That's what we'll do. That's what we'll do. For those of you guys sympathetic to him, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, 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 
Speaking of minors, China <laughs> imposes a gaming curfew for minors. Sell hard for five years. <laughs> Remind me in five years, please. So, uh, China has introduced a curfew, a gaming curfew for, uh, for gamers. And obviously this is going to have some pretty significant repercussions uh, for any company that is partnered with anybody doing business in, uh, in <laughs> minus with an E or, oh yeah, right. Both of them are, are really fucked on this, aren't they? Uh, but anybody that's doing business with China is going to, going to see a pretty nasty uh, uh, limit to their, or, uh, or, or, or drop in their total sales there because, because there are a number of, it's not just between certain times. There's actually like a, this, the, for first, here we go. So, gamers under the age of 18 are restricted from playing games between 10 p.m. and 8 a.m. Weekdays, your max playtime is 90 minutes. Weekends and holidays, your max time is three hours. Three hours on a weekday, I feel like, is, is a limit, little bit limiting. But on a weekend, holy shit. Holy shit. Not only that, but there's also a limit to the amount of money uh, that they can spend. Since gamers, 8 to 16 year old, can spend up to 200, uh, it was basically just $29 or 22 uh, pounds per month, while those between 16 and 18 years can spend up to 400, uh, which I would guess is probably double that, because that's the way the math works. Uh, so up to $60 per month. Per month! Now, I'm not going to pretend to know exactly how they're going to track this, Obviously, they have, like, legal documents and those, the, the whole, like, social point system network. And I know that they keep tabs on their people because China is a, is a, is a machine that is working towards goal of world domination. <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, I'm, so I'm not going to, kind of, uh, but I'm not going to pretend that, uh, that I know exactly how they track spending. But $60 a month is almost barely enough to buy a game. Like, like just barely enough to buy a game. I actually wonder how this could potentially reshape the, the games industry because there are companies who make enough money from China that this is going to really, really put a damper on their, um, on their earnings. And so they will try to find a way to either squeeze a lot of content and by a lot of content, I mean a lot of opportunities to monetize within a 90 minute period every day or a three hour period on the weekend, uh, each day on the weekend. Uh, are they referring to microtrans microtransactions specifically? Now that's, that is something that, again, I, I'm not gonna pretend to know exactly how they're going to track spending, whether it's a, a microtransaction or it's actually a purchase. Because if you buy it on your phone, then it could be a microtransactions in-app purchase. Like if it's just in-app purchase, which I don't believe it says here specifically, that is a separate purchase, but it just says that you can spend a certain amount. So uh, with that playtime allowance, you don't need more than one game per month. Yeah. Wasn't the uh, $60 a month for in-game purchasing? Was it for, oh, sorry. We just, we just talked about that. Uh, but it's about to turn around. Be all you free. <laughs> So yeah, like I said, it's going to have an interesting impact on a lot of folks because think like like League of Legends for example. Uh, you know, uh, League of Legends, a single map could take like forty five minutes. Are we going to imply that every kid under the age of eighteen uh, would be limited to one or two matches per day? Um, I should say League of Legends, but basically any mobile phone, no, any mobile game. Period. Uh, that has any kind of uh, a match system, match-based system. Uh, so, time to plug games in the Chinese market with ads to make up for all the lost revenue. So right now, what it, what what this here's what it looks like from like a business perspective is like now there's a clear number. It's like how do we as a company, how do we as a company get that sixty dollars a month? How do we make sure that every gamer under the age of eighteen is spending the majority, if not all of that $60 a month with our company on our game. And so that's what I'm 
curious is what's going to happen with the games industry because as we know there are a lot of uh there are a lot of game companies that rely pretty heavily not even all rely but they appreciate the amount of money they pull in from uh from uh from china i feel like it's important to emphasize that this only applies to minors uh, i don't have stats on the demographics for china but i bet the majority of revenue in china comes from adults it's true it's true yeah it could we don't we don't know what the data is on that but yeah i mean you're right it could it could be it could be a limit from adults it could be uh we don't know where the money is in terms of demographics uh i will say though that i i feel like gaming i feel like mobile gaming is now more prevalent with kids than it is with adults like five six years ago i would think maybe actually like 10 years ago i said like maybe 10 years ago or so we all assumed that all mobile gamers were women in the 30s like i remember we had we've had this conversation we just assumed that oh yeah it's, it's those match three games that like my that my wife plays that's what we assumed right it sounds sexist but that's literally what it was because that was that was that's what the data told us at the time was that this demographic play these kinds of games. And so what would happen is we'd get all those data, all that data would get lumped together and say, there are 40 billion gamers in the world. And it's like, ah, I mean, like everyone that picks up a phone and plays a match three isn't a gamer. And so it ended up being this whole thing. And so, yeah, we don't know. Uh, we don't know what the split is in, in China in terms of like, you know, how many of them are kids using parents' money or how, how many of them are just parents that just have money to blow on this kind of shit. Um... Do that mandatory sixty dollars microtransaction to their in their free to play game something like that for one yeah yeah it's true huh <laughs> just just something that just automatically just just debits uh, it's an anti mobile thing kind of see what they're thinking those are the worst for squeezing players for cash now uh, someone's probably gonna mention that this is similar uh, somebody already did mention when we talked about it in uh, in shitty earth that uh, Korea South Korea has uh, basically something very similar and I just want to point out that it is not. Uh, the South Korea has the Youth Protection Revision Act, which was in 2011, and that limits gaming between midnight and 6 a.m., so it's fewer hours, uh, and it's only for kids under the age of 16, and you can request uh, an exemption, and there's no spending limit. So while they technically have a curfew on games in South Korea, it is nowhere near as restrictive as what China is going to be imposing on their players. So something to keep an eye out for in the future, because some of these games are very popular with, with younger folks more than they are with, uh, with the old, older folks. <laughs> so uh, that kind of spending is going to be, or the, that kind of gameplay is going to be tailored to maximize the er basically earnings from that small period of time 90 minutes 90 minutes so what what games are they really not gonna be able to get a whole lot of time and probably games like world of warcraft they're probably gonna have a different well i mean if it's mobile specific if it's aimed at mobile then i guess it's not gonna be much of a deal big deal but um i frankly i'll be honest i don't know what games they play in in china like by and large i don't know what games they play on mobile uh in china i know that there are tons of mobas i know there are tons of uh, ARPGs, uh, basically Diablo clones. I know that there's just tons of that. Man, Diablo Immortal actually is going to be releasing uh, in China through NetEase. I'm certain that's going to take that. That's going to need some kind of retooling to in order to maximize the uh, uh, the earnings that you get in such a small period of time. I see, as kids who have the uh, have addictive issues are the parents that they will just let them play, such buy their kids their games. Uh, thinking time zones, what means less players in WoW? Rip Diablo Immortal in China. Maybe they've ported everything to mobile. That's and that's the thing. That's the other thing to note too is that mobile gaming is so big here and everywhere in the world, but very much so also in China. Uh, that this is this is this is like I me. Mean, if if twenty years ago you just said if you said yeah PC gaming we're going to limit your PC gaming like that would be huge because everyone was a PC or console gaming right. That's what everybody did. But now so many more people play mobile games then they play probably everything else combined if you look at like world stats i'm guessing um yeah china world first race oh gosh uh would switch be considered mobile or do we I, I don't know i don't know exactly what they would they consider mobile versus not versus how they're going to force certain things like i said i can't really pretend that i know how they how they do their their enforcement over there uh i wish i did because i would like to see like the actual numbers 
and how those things are split. But uh, but we don't. So so yeah, I guess Rip the Hubble Immortal. <laughs> One of their release over there. Uh, we might see a much bigger push uh, here in the state side, state side for that. Actually, you can only play docked outside of the limit. There you go. <laughs> you have to plug it in. It just turns off. You have to go plug it in. Uh, does China have still have accounts tied to their social security number equivalent? I'm not sure actually. Just to be clear on this, the idea of this sounds fine. Those kids should be blank. Uh, isn't a valid justification as to why rules like this should exist. It's not something that we should even think about accepting in our free society. That's right. That's right. I know Kittens is very much a proponent of parents should parents. As, uh, more so than any other actual parent that I know. Kittens. Uh, <laughs> um, but the government should not be the parent. Right? It sh the parents should be the ones to raise the kids. The government should, be the one should not be the ones to raise the kids. Uh, because, you know, the, it, we get shit like this, where it's like, now the government's telling you, you cannot play games. You cannot seek entertainment to, to escape whatever, however your shitty your life is. You can't do that. You can only do it for 90 minutes. So, yeah, no, you should definitely leave this kind of shit to, to parents. But some, I mean, some governments have uh, different thoughts on that. You ever thinks they are one entity, an ant kingdom, zerg, high find. <laughs> the overlord speaks. Uh, you look at it like the ESRB, where the ESRB says, uh, or even the, or even just uh, the film rating system. Like these things are put in place to like protect our kids, and we don't really want to see that shit go any further than that. We don't want to see, uh, we don't want to see it get to the point where they specifically say that it is now a finable offense if you allow a kid to play a game that is rated mature. Right? It's one thing to say we advise parents to do blank using, you know, Peggy or ESRB. We advise parents to do something. It's a whole other thing when you say you have to, because this is like, I think it's like a 10,000 something, maybe that was the, I think the $10,000 $10, offense was, uh, 10,000 whatever offense was the uh, South Korea one. But I'm sure there's a, there's a fee imposed with this one too, or fine. Um, it's almost like that, huh, huh? Almost. <laughs> it's not a bad if adjusted. Again, the adjustment should be we advise parents to not allow their kids to game between certain times, but that's just not what it's like in places where they're not free. So, I have no transition for this, but this is kind of interesting, I think, to a lot of folks here because we already see it going in this direction. It's almost one of those things you're just like, oh, of course, of course, duh. SteamDB says Valve could be working on a Google Stadia competitor. Google Stadia, for those who don't know, is a, an on-live style video game streaming platform that will be released sometime soon. Microsoft has its own, uh, there's xCloud that they're going to be uh, releasing sometime in the next uh, couple of years. These are services that are designed to allow you to play, to basically pick a game and instantly stream it without having to download it or store it locally. Which, which five, six years ago when OnLive did it, didn't really work out because latency and all that, right? It didn't really work out, compression artifacting. I mean, I remember one of their biggest games that they were pushing was Unreal, and it looked like shit. Like, it just looked so bad. Because <laughs> of the compression artifacts all over the place. Um... So we have things all encompassing databases. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God, Cloud. It's perfect. Uh, so Steam, I guess because of an entry that went into the went into their GitHub, the site code basically pointed to the to the to the uh, the fact that they might actually offer uh, actual game st streaming. And if you look at they already have video streaming. They already have now they just released the uh, the couch co-op online, couch online co-op. How <laughs> funny that is, yeah, just fucking Bill Gates. Mm. Uh, and so this is like, this is such, when I read this, I was like, of course they are. Of course they are. They already have the systems in place that they've already, like Steam Remote Play, which I actually tested it yesterday, uh, where I, I linked up my phone to, uh, um, to my Steam Link, or to my Steam. I launched Steam Link, and I played not on Wi-Fi, that was the thing that we were questioning yesterday in Discord. We were like, does it work off Wi-Fi? And so I turned off Wi-Fi and I loaded it up and it worked and it worked really, really well. Like, I'm not even kidding. It act like the response time was 
totally playable, even for some platforms. I've loaded up Dead Cells, and I got in there and started playing around, and I could totally play Dead Cells with it. Not as well as I could directly linked, but I'm holding the phone up and looking at the screen, because the screen is obviously showing what I'm playing, and the response time was just fantastic. Um, that couch, co couch co-op works with any game, not even local co-op, so technically, you can have two Steam accounts, then remote desktop and invite your other computer. Boom, yeah, Stadia. It doesn't know. That's a thing. That's what Steam Link does. You don't need to do all that crazy shit. That's what Steam Link is. You just pull out your phone and you just boop and then bam, your Steam, your, your, your actual computer loads up your, uh, uh, your, your Steam library and then you can play from there. Now, you can't buy anything. You can't buy anything when you're remote in from, uh, I don't know how it is on Android, but I'm fairly sure it's probably the same thing. But you can't buy anything when you load it up through uh, uh, through an iOS device because that violates a um, Apple has rules in terms of like things that are distributed through their platform cannot have purchases that don't go through their platform. That's the rule. I don't know how Android uh, handles it. I feel like they might do the same thing. But what happens is when you load up your Steam Link, it pops up and it shows just library. It's like big screen, you know, a big screen, big you know, Steam TV, whatever shit mode. Uh, and it's going to say just library instead of library, uh, store and all that, all that shit disappears. And what's interesting though, is I actually force quit the app just to see what, what the actual, what the computer would do. And all it did was just, it was just like a, like a perfect fade. It just went whoop. And just all of the other stuff that was, that was filtered out because I was streaming it to my device just showed up, just faded in nicely. Like they thought of that. It was a very graceful transition. It was actually kind of satisfying. Um, I bought games via Android, uh, Steam client. You have. You see, go oh, through the Android Steam client. Oh, interesting. Just interfacing it differently, but same results. Hey, why, it's correct why you can't buy subs from Twitch app on iPhone. There you go. And remote install the game. Interesting. Huh, I'll have, to, I'll have to pull up one of my Android devices and try that and see how that functions. So, yeah, I guess be on the lookout for Steam's upcoming video game streaming service. Personally, I think that that would be incredible as somebody who uses Steam all the time. Uh, there are, I actually wonder if this is going to be coupled with a service, like an actual, like, monthly service where you pay, you know, $5 like you do for, uh, for, for the Xbox Game Pass, and then you just gives you access to a bunch of shit. Like, that would be huge. Steam right now, Steam right now is in the position where iTunes was back in uh, probably 2000 and late 2000s, where iTunes was still selling you guys and me uh, songs for like a dollar, a dollar twenty nine, uh, and then Spotify started getting really popular. There are other services as well. We all use all the other services as well. Uh, but Spotify started getting really popular as like a legit service. First, it was overseas. I think it was like in the UK that, you, that uh, Spotify was like super popular over there and eventually made its way over to the States. Spotify was around in the early 2000s uh, overseas. And so with that, iTunes basically died. Why would I pay for a song that I, that I really don't even like own because the actual M4A file or whatever it is you download, I guess only works in iTunes and all that stuff. Like this is the way it was at the beginning. Uh, later, I think they changed it so you could play it anywhere. So it was like this really just like, just, just enclosed siloed system that you really couldn't get out of. And then it's like fucking Spotify. I can just pull up my phone and just play or pull up a mobile device or, or, or having a back window, whatever. Cause it was like Spotify and Pandora. That was the other one. Um, it was included a lot of mobile subscription bundles. We're talking like the, the beginning of 2000s, I think. Is that, just, is that what you're referring to? Um, but yes, so you say passive streaming, sure, everyone's doing it. I'm just not sold. So, so now that's my point is that Steam is in that same position that iTunes was in where they were selling, they were, they're selling games that you don't really own. You own, but you're not really, you don't really own. And if other services like Google Stadia or Microsoft xCloud start coming out and saying, yeah, just pay us a you know, $5 or $15 a month and you can play any game you want as long as you want, as often as you want, suddenly that's going to, that's going to, that's going to probably instantly age Steam. Thankfully, Steam is, uh, is Steam is probably, is going to be taking these steps to, 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 uh, to keep up with the Jones in this case. Permanent renting. Steam goes away, you're done with those games, hence GOG Solutions. 
Rip LimeWire. Yep. Discord for what? You gotta tell me what it is first. Uh, somewhere two thousands. Uh, you see what is this? iTunes was absolute dog shit. Spotify way better. Yeah, iTunes has always been pretty bad. Like, yeah, iTunes has always been pretty bad. Um, iTunes is actually, I believe, phased out completely now. Like, I think it's just pretty much gone. I think it's pretty much gone. So, yeah. Steam app buying. I'll take your word for it, dude. We gotta move on. We gotta move on. So, next up. ZeniMax has to refund. Uh, we, have some, we have some Aussie folks in here, don't we? Well, listen. If you bought Fallout 76, you might be able to get your money back. So the ACCC has accepted a court-enforceable undertaking from three related video game companies after they acknowledged that they were likely to have misled consumers about their consumer guarantee rights in relation to the online action game Fallout 76. So the companies, ZeniMax, ZeniMax Europe, ZeniMax Australia, accepted that their actions were likely to have contravened the Australian consumer law. Likely. So this is them basically admitting that, hey, yeah, you know what? The game is nowhere near what we pitched it to be. And, well, I guess we go and offer refunds. Uh, what about No Man's Sky? Well, No Man's Sky is actually, well, I mean, we're beating a dead horse on that one, but No Man's Sky has pretty much redeemed itself. Uh, but some folks are still salty about it. Uh, so ZeniMax has a knowledge that they are likely to have misled certain Australian consumers about their rights to, re to a refund when they experience faults with, it, with their Fallout 76 game. So... If you purchased the game uh, between, was it 24 November 2018 and 1st of June 2019? Oh, sorry. So ZeniMax will offer, uh, sorry, ZeniMax will offer to provide refunds to consumers who contacted them between 24 November 2018 and 1 June 2019. So what this means is that you have to have already attempted to make, to get a refund. Uh, and it says, because they declined a bunch. So for some of you guys, yeah, it's too late. But uh, I know a lot of people jumped on that bandwagon of trying to get their shit back. But I'm sure some probably just gave up. They're like, oh, I'm not going to try because I'm not going to get it. Uh, so just a note that this is basically you know, Bethesda saying, uh, or ZeniMax saying that they are, well, that they, that they misled consumers. So the next time, the next time there's a game reveal or something, just know that they have admitted that they were not particularly good at communicating what the product actually is. That is your takeaway from that. Australia is pretty good at not letting companies fuck over their consumers. Yeah, and also, like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think that uh, Fallout 76 is, like, actually, like, $76 in Australia. Isn't it something crazy? Like, the, the markup for game purchases or game, games in Australia is, like, insane. So, that's even more of a reason to be upset that the game that you bought for some stupid amount is basically broken and nowhere near what they, uh, or at least doesn't meet the, meet the, uh, uh, how it was pitched. Kind of argument to No Man's Sky, if you broke up because your girlfriend, boyfriend was shitty and they clean up later, it's too late. We've moved on. I guess so. I guess so. Um, it's a revolutionary new gaming game that will change the way you game. Oh, what the hell? Uh, those are masterful. What? Oh, and fucking over Australians. Yes, 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 yes. The, the ISPs are, huh? Yeah, that's what I've heard. So, but hey, at least at least if you uh, reached out between those dates, you can you can go ahead and pick up a uh, a refund. <gasps> lastly, lastly, I feel like we got through this quick. Oh no, it's been an hour actually. Uh, so lastly, and this is a bit more of a discussion piece. I'm almost gonna we're gonna uh, pull this up here. This is something that came up this morning. Polygon, Polygon put out an article saying, in 2020, I can no longer abide the 100-hour RPG. Effectively saying, because for some reason, some people don't, can't really interpret that headline. Um, what they're saying is, in 2020, they can no longer abide the 100-hour RPG. You see? You see the difference? Hopefully I, hopefully I rephrase that enough to make it clear. So in this article, it's a very short article, and, and you can read it if you want. Um, I'll try not to mischaracterize it in any, in any such a way. But in the article, 
the writer says things like, I have no more patience left for a 100 plus hour RPG. Now, he's not talking about, about the Outer Worlds, because Outer Worlds is not a 100 hour RPG. It can be. It very well can be. Uh, but no, you can't. He actually right there. He says, do you know what's fantastic about Outer Worlds? It's about 20 hours, maybe a little more if you want to take your time with it. All those 20 hours are a good time, and then the game's done. There's no more. Um, are the comments just okay, Boomer, again and again? <laughs> the, the, the Twitter comments are. Yeah, they are. Uh, reviewers always want short games so they can get articles out quick. Yeah, so that's going to be part of our discussion here, but I really want to point out that this is this is one of those, this is what's wrong with games journalism type things, right? Is that some folks get to the point where they can no longer do their job. In any other, I feel like in any other reputable game news source, which I can't think of one, uh, I feel like this article would basically be the equivalent to tendering your resignation. Because in it, he says, I have no more patience left for the 100 plus hour RPG. Uh, every time I hear a game described in this way, I break out in a cold sweat. That's not exciting. That is a threat. So, so a, big, a, a big game with lots of stories. A threat! Uh, who has the time to play each big game as it comes out? Not me, that's who. I just have stuff going on in real life that cuts down on my gaming time. And it's literally my job to be involved in video games. I can't imagine how much worse it would be if I had an office job uh, or if my husband and I had kids. Uh, Kotago has time. <laughs> this game is a chore. I know, this game is a chore. Oh, man. Uh, if it takes 26 minutes to get through the tutorial, yeah, yeah, it's, this, this article is definitely a, I would, definitely a, a, a blight, if you, if, if, really, if they could have room for any more, on, uh, Polygon's, uh, journalism here. The answer's your pronoun about finding a, uh, no, it does not actually, kittens, I thought it did, but it does not. It does not. Uh, <laughs> so I'll do my best to just keep it neutral here. Uh, elsewhere it says that now that I'm nearly 30, I have to spend considerably more time on mundane stuff like when a game, like dishes, sorry, uh, and the occasional bout of depression over taxes. I've gotten to the point that when a game promises a richly layered experience with hundreds of hours of gameplay and an immersive quest system that really sinks you into the world, I weep and wail. Um, yes, and the writer is on the third playthrough. I don't understand. <sighs> As somebody, okay, I, I sympathize with the writer about not having enough time to play games. I think like Destiny, Outer World, etc. Right? Like some of these games, they take a long time to get through. Uh, but I, but me personally, I have like three part-time jobs, and I have a kid that I dedicate several hours of every day to. Uh, I have a dog, I have a puppy that I have to walk like three times a day. Otherwise, he's got shred shit in my front room, which he's been doing like every fucking day this week. And I, uh, and I still, I still try my best to budget my time accordingly. Now, this is where I feel like, this is why I'm sympathetic. Not because, man, I'm older than that and I still, I still do this shit. Because no, I barely make it through. I barely make it through doing what I do. And I do feel like sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm just... I'm on my last wit trying to get shit done. But in this case, I do feel like this is Polygon's fault. If they're not allowing their writers the time to actually sit down and play a game thoroughly enough to have a legit, like an actual uh, thorough, thorough breakdown of the game. Now, the outer world aside, because most, most open world RPG games they just name one. Guarantee you could probably get through the main storyline in under 20 hours. Right? There's probably no... Okay, I shouldn't say that because one of you guys will think of one. There are probably very few open world RPGs that don't have a straight shot to the end that would, that would take you 20 hours max. Um, Witcher. No, you could go through that as well. You could get that in under 20 hours. You could get that in under 20 hours. Witcher? Uh, maybe hire more people, uh, people more competent at playing games than Dean Tagahashi. Well, this is, this is a different writer. This is, uh, Cass Marshall here, but, uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I get you. Uh, so, as somebody who used to work for a, uh, a site that did do game reviews, it's hard to, because most of your, and I feel like in this case it's the same, because most of your staff works remotely, you're not in an office or anything like that. It's hard to really 
like really cut out time and and know exactly what that person's working on because typically when somebody works remote typically when somebody works remote they have basically free reign of uh, of of their time to an extent like they have some flexibility of their time uh they have goals that they need to they need to reach and they have to reach those goals and those deadlines by a certain time right um and so it sounds to me like if we have issues with and this is not the first time like he even says uh, so that, that quote where I says, now that I'm nearly 30, I have to spend considerably more time on mundane stuff like dishes. That quote actually came from a different article. So clearly this is a trend that uh, for this particular writer, that this person just does not have the time to review these long ass games anymore. Uh, now his tweet about the issue, his tweet about it kind of threw me off a little bit because I was trying to be sympathetic with them. With them. Uh and then they say, who is playing all these 100-plus hour RPGs, 100%ing them? Stop it. You're only encouraging them. No, please encourage them. Please encourage them. Because games journalists don't have to like every single fucking game. You don't have to like every single game that comes out. There are going to be lots of games that you're not into. And that is okay. You can just not play those games or get another job. Or talk to Polygon or whoever you're, whoever's paying your bills and say, hey, I need more time in order to thoroughly review this product that you want me to write a review for. Otherwise, I'll be doing a disservice to the brand, which we know Polygon has a brand issue for some of us, uh, for a good chunk of us. Uh, and also to the most important thing to players. Uh, he says, whatever he's just like. What if I just like long RPGs? Yeah, exactly. Some folks just like long RPGs. And that's just like, there's no reason. There's no reason to say, I mean, that's what, so I was, I was sympathetic. And then I read this tweet and I was just like, wow, what a dick. <laughs> like, really? Like, just like, if you don't like a game or, or style a game or a genre or whatever, just don't, just don't volunteer or just tell your boss, Hey, I can't do that game because I don't have enough time to, to do it thoroughly. And it's just not the kind of game for me. Um, as somebody who was assigned games in the past, when I was doing the BFF report, like they would, they would tell me that the marketing department or sales department would say, Hey, we got this, uh, we got this game that just, we're trying to work this deal up. We want to package a BFF report in this deal. Can we rely on you to get a, uh, to get a BFF report out on for this game? And sometimes I was like, I'm not gonna play that fucking game. Like there were games that I'm just like, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And they were like, okay, cool. And they just move on. And that's the way it should be. Like if I, if I, if it's a game that I can't, that I don't feel like I could do justice to, and it would be unfair. Like I just go in, just like, I hate these games. I'm going to review it. Uh, unless it's done in like a satirical or com comedic way. I can't imagine I, that that's just not the right answer. And so obviously there's an issue with Polygon where they're not allowing enough time for their reviewers to, to play the games. So why the fuck read any Polygon review? You don't know how much time they had. They probably rushed that shit. Probably watch a couple YouTube videos, read some Reddit comments, and then just slap together a review. Because they don't have time, because they have to put out three more articles that same week, or same couple days. So. <sighs> it should be okay for developers who want to spend a lot of time creating a living, breathing world to do that because some of us appreciate that stuff. Some of us want to get into a game, but my, 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 the game that I like to refer to for me that I put a lot of time in without actually getting shit done is, uh, is Grand Theft Auto. All of them, uh, v v three Vice City, like fucking all of them. Uh, I never, I, I think only in Grand Theft Auto 3, or maybe it was Vice City, only in one of the games that I actually complete the main storyline. It was the one that ends on the island in the middle of the map. I can't remember which one that was. Um, but that was the only one that I actually finished the game. <laughs> because there's just so much shit to do. And I love that stuff. I mean, that could very easily be a 100-hour RPG. Uh, if he decided to do everything, I'm, sh I'm certain I have logged a hundred hours and at least Grand Theft Auto Vice City. Definitely. 20 hours doing donuts and parking lots. Yeah. Yeah. And I fucking loved it. And I loved it. It was a game. It was a game that I could basically play how, how I wanted. Um, and so, yeah, those kinds of games should, should just continue to exist. And we should still, if you want to play those games, you should. And if you, if you don't want to play those games then you shouldn't fucking write about them. When your entire review, well, not a review, but 
when you write an article dedicated to how tired you are of playing these games, maybe that means the game is not for you. Um, there's also an issue with some developers aren't sending review copies out early enough to avoid leaks. And, you know, I know that this is... This is that's that's a tough one because you're right. Like the the copy doesn't get there soon enough, and in some cases they deliberately not send review copies to certain sites. I think it happened with uh, Borderlands Three and Kotaku. They didn't send them a uh, a key for for Borderlands or review copy of Borderlands until I think like the day before or something. Like they definitely delayed it for them. Uh, and, you know, as a result, I don't even know what Kotaku, if they ever even did a review, a full review of, uh, of Borderlands 3 as a result of that. Because it, it so you can see, it really does hurt. Like, if you don't have, if you don't have a review out, like, right away, everyone's already made up their minds. They already have the game, or they, or, or, uh, or they watched a stream, they watched 10 minutes of a stream, they're like, oh yeah, this is a game for me. And that's it. If certain sites leaks up for release, we blacklist. Yes, so that is something that you do. You just blacklist them. That totally happens. I, I, I think, I think I got in trouble. I got in trouble once. I can't remember for what, but it was a big deal. I can't remember who I pissed off, but uh, oh yeah, it was Blizzard. That's right. That's right. We got. Uh, it was like one of the first expansions for Hearthstone, and we got a bunch of screenshots, and we. We released them, and boy was Blizzard mad. Boy was Blizzard super mad. Uh, <laughs> and so yeah, and I think I was the one that made that call. Uh, yeah, I think I was the one that made that call. So I might still have my job, but I I I, I knew that uh, that we, this would get clicks, and so I fucking did it. Uh, there's a few of us that were just like, yeah, just fucking do it, and that was pretty much it. But I don't think I was the one that actually got it, got in trouble for it. But uh, does this show just how traditional media is done for? I think so. I mean, with the amount of like instant gratification you could get from, hey, this game is out. I'm gonna go watch. I'm gonna go watch a uh, uh, some gameplay on Twitch. It just came out. Like literally, the minute it comes out, I could watch somebody playing it. Yeah, just go to Twitch. Just go to Twitch and watch it. It's just it's so much easier because most in most cases, especially if you're an experienced player, right? If you've played enough games to know. Just by watching a video for like 10 minutes, you know, watching somebody play live for like 10 minutes, you know, it's like, okay, this is the game I could get into. Like, that is what you're, you are one less person who's going to read a review from Polygon or Kotaku or IGN or any other site. Uh, trying to avoid Twitch. Everyone's playing Death Stranding. I'm avoiding spoilers. Oh yeah, because it's coming out on PC, so I guess you could wait for that. I actually, I just saw, uh, I, I've actually seen a few people say that, that they, they are trying to watch Death Stranding. And this is the case with most single player RPGs that people are inclined to like. Now, the ones that maybe they don't really give a shit about, the watch, right? Uh, if they don't plan, ever plan on buying the game. But, but there are a lot of folks who don't want to go and, uh, they, they don't want to play, I'm sorry, they don't want to watch somebody play an RPG because they might play it themselves very soon and they don't want to have any, uh, any spoilers. 30 minutes of let's play is more important more important versus a review because a lot of people can make their own decisions based off of that just off of the gameplay itself and yeah like getting all this stuff out before launch or at launch is just so critical so i mean you got a long ass game you don't get a uh here, here's what here's what these sites maybe should do if they don't get an advanced copy of something just don't review it just just don't review it like, I, I, I want to say Kotaku did that at one point in time. Uh, maybe they did it with Borderlands 3, and that's the reason why I never, like, watched the review or saw the review. But, or, yes, or do the, the Donkey approach. Donkey's got a great approach. He just puts out a video, and then you watch it, because it's not really a review, necessarily. I mean, it is. It's an entertaining video, and it's especially entertaining if you did play the game. But at the very least, you know it's going to be funny, uh, and that's that's his shtick. It's actually that's that's a lot like um, uh, uh, zero punctuation. That's the same thing. You look at you look at, uh, at his videos, and you don't watch it. I don't I don't watch uh, a zero punctuation video for 
for the actual review content. I watch it for the comedic purpose. And if, if it's a game I've played, like actually, I want to go see if there's an uh, if there's a uh, there's one for the Outer Worlds. Yeah, Yahtzee. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry to say Yahtzee. Uh, I couldn't think of the name, but yes. Uh, whenever someone I met hasn't played Breath of the Wild, I show them Donkey's video. Exactly. It's perfect. People appreciate someone's opinion on the way for it. Sometimes people like Angry Joe also has a review, has a review videos a week after release. Videos tend to go, I tend to do good comparisons to other games as well, whereas read, read reviews seem solely focused on that specific game. Yeah, well, it vary. I mean, that varies from 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 game to game, uh, depending on like you know what game it is. So sometimes you can't you can't not liken a game to another game. Uh, but yeah, so I think that's it. <laughs> so the the hundred hour RPG, I think, is fine. If a, a site does not allow its readers, as allow its writers enough time to review a copy of a game or review a game, then the writer shouldn't write it and maybe the actual publisher should not release it or just say hey you know what we didn't get an advanced copy of the game mm, at this point it's really not worth our time to even mention it if anything that would be some throwing some serious shade at the actual developer it's like we don't think your game is even worth reviewing after the fact that it's been released sure that might piss off a couple publishers but you got to do something waste will you waste someone's time playing a game they don't like they write that they hate it and then no one reads it uh, it's still waiting. What might be reviews or BF reports on many games? I still hope. I should just go like rename some of those videos BF reports. That that would solve a lot of problems. Um, so, escape is this site to listen to. Me. Yeah, well, yeah. I knew it was something like that. I couldn't remember. Yeah, yeah. Yahtzee is the name, but zero punctuation. I thought was the name of the series. Yahtzee is the name of the guy. Eh, I can't remember. It actually has been a long time since I watched one of his videos. Should probably do that again. The Outer Worlds. Uh, so. That's it, dudes. We actually got a pretty heated discussion about this. Not heated, but a pretty, uh, a, a, a pretty deep discussion about this exact article uh, earlier today. So if you're in Discord, you could probably scroll back if you want to read that. There's a lot. We're going to fight later. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna beat it. We're gonna fight later. Uh, they keep giving them RPGs to review instead of uh, cool shooter games. Yeah, I think that yeah, if you can't if you can't review a game, you don't have no time to review a game. Just skip it. I have to make that decision all the time. Like, there are games that, you know, I feel like I'm really close, like Outer Worlds. I did the Outer Worlds video, and I felt like I was, it was just close enough to release that maybe you'd do pretty well. Nah. But Cube World, I got out, I think, just like, just like a day after the actual Steam release, and that did, like, stupidly well. So it really does help, man. Like, it really, really, really does help to get shit out on time. Or, or go the donkey approach, or the, the uh, zero punctuation Yahtzee approach of just making a video that you would watch years after the uh after the game's been released uh, or anger joe if that's your thing so so that's it was a giant bomb falls every says i was like fuck it i don't want to force people to play a shitty game they don't don't enjoy uh i thought that was death stranding actually just recently when they said something along the lines of Nobody here wants to actually finish it or something. Wasn't that the case? Maybe it was also Fallout 76 too. But that, that's happened enough. I mean, it should just happen more often. It's like, hey, you know what's after the fact? We can't really... Hmm. No Randy and no Soldier News. No, none of that stuff. Like I said before, with all this stuff that's happened with that other company, uh, Epic is actually looking pretty fucking good. Uh, and by association, in my opinion, uh, so does Borderlands. It's one of Borderlands News. Hey, maybe we should go and check that out. <laughs> Two out of five, so it's possible. There you go. Uh, it says that uh, Hideo Kojima might move into making movies instead, which I feel like would be a great move for them. I actually, actually have a discussion with a friend of mine, uh, and I said, thank God he's moving to movies because that's, you know, how many fewer hours I have to spend in a game. Like in a game I'm, not gonna, I'm never going to play Death Stranding. There's no fucking way. All of that, all, I would watch, I will watch a Death Stranding movie, which there are plenty of those on YouTube. If you go and look for, uh, look up like, uh, Bioshock Infinite, the movie, just put the name of the game space, the movie. And what you'll find is a whole bunch, you'll, you'll find videos that people will piece together of the story elements from the, from a game. They'll piece it together like a, uh, uh and you can watch it like a movie. It's fucking cool. It's not just cutscenes. Or, or, or actually, yeah. Oh, sorry. In quotes. Yeah, you, you could also search for that if you want to. 
But uh, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not even just cutscenes in some cases. Like uh, Bioshock Infinite, the one that uh, that I tried to get Jen to watch, but she wouldn't watch because I really wanted her to like. I really loved the story. I thought it was great. So, so well executed uh, and so interesting. But she just wasn't having it. But yeah, Bioshock Infinite, the movie, also includes a bunch of side discussion that happens uh, uh, in context, like in like show fights and everything like that. So I thought it was pretty interesting. But anyways, so that's it. That's it. <laughs> it's not a 10 out of 10 game, but Death Stranding is at least trying something different. Yeah. Uh, I'll wait for the movie. You guys have a good weekend. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Sunday, for being right here. Hi. <laughs> Whoop. I will see you guys later. Bye.